Hello, my name is Tony Guarnaccia. I have a digital marketing agency called Big Fish Results in uh, Rhode Island. And we focus on um, getting visibility for clients, getting them engagement, which is where content is so critical, and then ultimately driving results, which is different for every client. That's the focus. I'm the founder, and so I, I, uh, my role is primarily CEO. I'm going to oversee all the strategy. I'm Mara Webster. I am the founder of Lila Blue Strategies. Um, and Lila Blue is, our tagline is real, meaningful marketing. Um, so what we do is we really focus on our individual clients' unique needs, what their overall goals are, bringing their teams together internally, aligning them, and then helping them grow and, and knock it out of the park. Um, and a lot of that is through sort of content management and focusing on the real stuff that they have to offer. I am Nicole Kohler. I am the content manager for WooCommerce, which is a free e-commerce plugin for WordPress. As the content manager, I'm responsible for developing content for our blog, managing our email marketing, um, doing proofreading, writing product pages, pretty much anything that is written goes by me. I do. And I have two blogs that I run. One is for iBeamLearning.com and the other is for So I'll speak to a couple challenges. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, I have an agency. So our primary, uh, so we help our clients with their content strategy. And so inevitably, we run into two challenges with clients. One is they just don't have a checklist strategy, first of all, uh, that's always a challenge. And then the second one is getting the content from them in the first place to even write uh, something out. So that's, those are kind of the two main things we address. Um, I, I agree completely. Working with clients is um, sort of where do they start is sort of another one. And for them, it's looking at the big picture, right? Mapping it out. So taking a look at the calendar and they know up here what they want to talk about, what their goals are, you know, revenue goals, any, any of the organization goals. Um, and it's connecting the dots with what do we need to talk about to let people know that we do that? Or how do we talk to them? Who are we talking to? You know, all those sort of putting that piece together. So I guess that's the strategy piece is probably the toughest. For me personally, it's like the cobbler's kid has no shoes. I don't have time to do my own writing. So that's sort of the middle of the night kind of doesn't get done. Yeah. <laughs> so for us, we already know who our customers are. Um, they're users of WooCommerce and they're looking for advice. Um, luckily, we've got that part nailed. But the biggest thing we struggle with, our biggest challenge is definitely consistency, making sure that we're producing content on a regular basis, that we are um, getting things out on time, that we're doing all the things we need to do on time, whether that's the actual writing, uh, the publishing, the social promotion, the marketing aspect. Um, since we are a small team and content is a fairly new thing to Woo, the consistency aspect has been our biggest hurdle. So for a moment, let's talk about the actual process, maybe some tips for people who are writing for other, other clients, aside from themselves. Um, I know for me, for a long time, I was in charge of writing a blog for an insurance agency. And it's very sort of nuanced because every insurance around the country, every state has different laws, and you don't want to put anything out there that isn't true. So I asked that members of employees for a week, any questions that they answered, just dump into a spreadsheet. So then I had all the emails that they were, you know, were responding to, and then I sent it to the president of the company, and I said, okay, here's
here's what you know I pulled together for you, and we met on Skype, and he answered the questions in detail, and I recorded the call, and then from there I had like six months worth of blog posts for him. So, well, I know Maura, and I know that you all have your own little system. So, sure. Uh, so, kind of the corollary to not kind of getting content is the client saying they don't have time to provide it. And that, I think that's kind of the same issue in a way. And so one of the ways we get around that is when we first onboard a new client, we have a very defined process. And part of that process starts with an interview. So we have a set of, of um, questions that we ask every client. And they're simple. They start with what you learned in grade school. right? Who are you? What do you do? Where, you know, where do you serve clients, et cetera? And one of the things that makes us more efficient is we record those calls. So we set up a phone call, we record those phone calls, and then those phone calls get transcribed. So it's the client's own words, so we know they're in line with it. And then after that gets transcribed, we put that into our own system. So we, we built our own software for this, but a spreadsheet works just as well. Uh, and we put in the, uh, the system, and then the client can approve it. And so it's very systematic. So it makes the process much, much more easy. But in terms of uh, the takeaway for this audience, would probably be recording the phone calls because then you get the record of it, you transcribe it. I need to be taking notes. <laughs> um, I actually have a couple of different clients who, it, what they do is not in my sort of natural class. So a lot of learning on the fly. Um, and I do something a little bit similar. I have um, this series that I've created called Blueprints. Um, and I do now have one for blogs because that was one of the most challenging is going back and forth and getting enough of the information without getting halfway through a post and being like, I have no idea. So I think that for me has been, it offsets that challenge a little bit um, of kind of pulling that information out. The other piece too is with every piece I do, I kind of break it down what to do after the post is written too, and I'm probably going to do that a little bit later. Um, like what to do with it after is sort of part of that. All right, so what comes first, the post or the SEO? For me, for my own, it's absolutely the post because I just write about what is interesting to me at the time. Or, um, and then I go back through and I circle through the SEO. But I know for Nicole, I think it's, it's probably not the same. I sense some healthy debate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't say great, actually. Um, I think it depends on what your goal is. So for us, a lot of the posts that we're writing, um, there may be a HR competitor that has a post that we're trying to overtake. And in that case, we do really want to think about SEO before we start writing. Um, what keywords are we intending to target? What is the goal of this post? Like, do we want it to rank highly or do we want it to serve our customers? There are a lot of cases where um, we don't really think about SEO because it's more important to serve our customers and answer a question and lead them to a product or a solution than it is to rank number one in a search engine. Like, you know, our goal is very clear. But um, if the intent of a post is to be found in search engines, we do think about SEO before we get started. And that often means these are the keyword, keywords we want to hit, or these are the links we want to put in the post, or these are the, even sometimes with outreach, these are the people we want to reach out to when the post is done. So again, I think it all depends on what the goal of your content is, and if you have that goal in mind before you get started, that can help you decide what approach you want to take with SEO. I'll have to hit on this one if you don't mind. Uh, so I think it depends on how you define SEO. So a lot of people look at SEO as a mechanism for ranking, uh, but we look at that as well, but I would say SEO also is a great indicator of the user intent. So if you're writing SEO and you're leveraging SEO properly, you're actually speaking to your ideal prospect. And so what we do is we take kind of, to your earlier session, we kind of look at what keywords people are using and we write the content from that perspective, not necessarily to rank, uh, but to make sure we're targeting and saying the things in the right language properly. Because a lot of times, uh, businesses will kind of get in their own mindset and use kind of their own phraseology 
which is not how the actual um, customers or clients or patients, it's not their terminology. So we wanna make sure there's a message match there. And so that's kind of why we always start with SEO from that perspective at, at the very least. So I think this leads us into analytics. How often do you check them? Do you ever check them? Do you care? So you want to look at the kind of the volume of traffic that's going to that page, of course, but very important, probably number two, is the bounce rate. So how many people are going to this, the page and then leaving? So how many weren't engaged with your content? And then the other kind of analytics we look at, which is more sales driven, is if you're leveraging any kind of marketing automation platform like a HubSpot, a Pardot, anything like that. Uh, we like that because we, we actually send daily reports to the sales team. So if we know a prospect Look at, look at the content, and they've been in the hopper for a while, we, we tell them, okay, now's the time to go after and, and make a phone call to that prospect, because maybe they're back in the market now. Especially in my agency, it's a longer buying cycle. So, so sometimes it's a long, low, uh, longer buying cycle, you know that your page are engaged again, it's a great time to re-engage that relationship. And, and for me, for my personal blog, I don't really care popular and you can posts and you can or pages and you can say you know what I'm gonna write a little bit more about this or I spent a lot of time on this how-to and it didn't really do go very well so perhaps nobody really wants to know about that and I need to go in a different direction so I, I think that the feedback put into your own is, is very valuable and it can be tricky for clients to get that so if we're sort of playing around with the numbers, let's have the hard question of how do you grow your audience? Because you do want readers, right? Uh, so, again, being an agency, we try to systematize everything so we can be consistent with every client. And uh, we have a pattern. So, in a nutshell, what we try to do is post the content, make sure it's search engine optimized, and then uh, we email that out to a client list, to my point earlier, so we can see who looks at it. Uh, and then a 
big part of it is Facebook as well. So you can you know, share the content, etc. But one thing you can do that's very powerful is advertise on Facebook. And when someone hits that page, they essentially can be part of your list. So you know, there's basically two kinds of lists. There's your email list, but then you can also have what's called a retargeting list. So you can, uh, once someone hits your, your page, you identify them anonymously, and then they're in your funnel. You can basically have ads come up to them at a later point in time to get them back to your, your site. So that's one of the best ways to grow your list. And one other, one other addition, uh, what I found the best way to grow a list is through events. So whether it's um, doing a speaking engagement like this, or it's a webinar, or any other kind of event, that's the best way I've found personally to grow uh, an email list. I was just asking if we could have a specific as to the tools used for your funneling, how you are yeah, so basically from a retargeting perspective, we'll put on the, uh, there's, I don't have the name off the top of my head, but there's several um, uh, WordPress plugins to add either Google uh, retargeting, which they call Google remarketing, and then Facebook has a retargeting pixel as well. They both have plugins, I just don't recall them off the top of my head, but if you Google it, you'll find them. So that's from a uh, list-based perspective, and then from a marketing automation perspective to send out their drip sequences of emails. Uh, we use a proprietary system and we also are HubSpot partners. So we leverage kind of HubSpot or our own in-house system depending on the size of the client and what their needs are. Um, I'm gonna make it very, very simple, probably slightly too simple, but um, consistency is a big one. We found that um, if you are consistently responding to comments and consistently thanking people, even if their comment is just like, I really like this post, and saying, well, thank you so much for your feedback. Let us know if we can help you with anything. That has helped grow our audience dramatically because they know that we're listening. They know that we care about what they have to say. Even if we get negative feedback, even if we get um, a response that's really hard to read and really hard to digest, we take the time to respond to them, and that has turned some people who are our biggest critics into our biggest supporters, because we're consistent about it. So being consistent about responding to feedback, being consistent about publishing, and just keep doing what you're doing. Um, another thing is when you get that feedback, listen. I mean, like truly listen. Don't be like, oh yeah, sure, that's a cool idea. Listen and act on it. No, I mean, I've seen that done, and the company I worked for before, I, I know you, you all are laughing, the company I worked for before was very, very guilty of this. Like, they got feedback all the time, and would be like, oh yeah, that'd be a cool idea for a blog post. Let's go do something else now. That's my, my biggest, 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 like, annoyance. So listen and act accordingly, and value the feedback that you're getting, and, and value um, what your customers, or readers, or visitors are saying to you. Um, that consistency and that appreciation of them can grow your audience dramatically because it shows, again, that you really, really care about them and you care about what they want and need. Yeah, I would say um, the consistency with the engagement, really, and on all your different platforms, right? So, um, yes, obviously on your blog and on the site, but everywhere else you're connected to your social channels, um, private groups on Facebook tend to really engage readers and grow readership, um, i found with a couple of different clients. And um, sort of the freebie piece too. You know, I think a lot of us get caught up when we're writing for clients or business writing, there's always a call to action that gets them to do something we need them to do. Um, and if you just kind of shift it around and make it about giving something, right? So not just I'm giving them the post, the post is great. Um, but instead of asking them to do something with that post, give them something that they need, that your, your audience needs. Yeah, like sort of here. On the topic of giving, um, I read a post about two years ago with something called Content Upgrades, which is um, where you write a post and at the end you're like, hey, here's this free piece of content that you can take along. So uh, maybe you talked about, um, I don't know, like here's how to, uh, I don't know, here's how to repair your clothing. At the end, there's a PDF and you can download a step-by-step -step guide to doing that with extra information. Um, you can ask for an email address in exchange for that and put them on your email list, or you could just give it to them for free. Um, that content upgrade tactic is really, 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 
really, I have to stress this, really <laughs> helpful for some people in growing their readership and getting a lot of engagement because it's this, it's this lovely little bonus at the end that people are like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. So um, that's something to keep in mind. I'm trying to remember where I first read this, but if you Google content upgrade, you'll find it and there's a great post on it. So definitely check that out. No, I, I totally agree with Nicole of an add-on, an ebook, a PDF, a downloadable, and especially if you're tying it into your email list, which actually maybe we should talk about because I absolutely believe 100% you need to cultivate an email list because the money is in your list. So. Uh, well, the other thing you know we talked about regards to bonuses, generally the shorter form of the content the better because a lot of times if it's long form, people just won't get along, uh, get out around to reading it. And so one thing that seems to be working really well right now is video. So you can do like a three part video series to give your, your email, their email address in exchange for that. That works very well. Again, like I said before, events are fantastic. So any kind of event, even if it's a pre-recorded web webinar, we've done quite a few of those. So you can basically do a webinar and make it evergreen so it continually goes to a specific list. And specificity, that's probably the only other thing I mentioned. So if you're targeting, I think you may have mentioned this in your earlier segment, uh, but if you're targeting somebody, sometimes if you can verticalize it, you know, so if it's a general post, but then you say, oh, well, this is for dentists, or whatever, you, whatever your niche is, then all of a sudden it gets much more engagement because people can relate to it. And that helps you get a larger list as well. Email list. <laughs> um, you know, I think honestly, freshening up the content in your email list and being consistent um, is huge because they're gonna click on videos, right? Yes, infographics. Um, you know, it's funny. I have a couple of clients who are like, "We want an infographic with this one comment on it." And I was like, no, "That's not an infographic. That's a graphic. <laughs> that's not an infographic. It's very tiny piece of info." Um, but I think really um, just engaging people through it, making it content that you can interact with. And yes, drive them back, right? Bring them back to your posts, bring them back to your site. Um, but keep them simple, more frequent and simple rather than like, here's my email newsletter for three months. You know, just kind of um, A challenge I hear from a lot of small business owners and a lot of bloggers is, I'm already working on content, I don't have time for email too. And um, that's not necessarily true, but you just have to find the right tools. So there are plugins that will send your posts um, every time you publish a post, it will, like you can use Jetpack Publicize, it'll send it out to your social media, or you can get plugins that will send it like your RSS feed to an email daily, or every time you publish. Um, you can once monthly go into MailChimp and just drop the links from your blog into a simple template and hit send, and send it to the list that you've built with a MailChimp like uh, widget on your blog. Um, so. Don't approach it as, I don't have time, approach it as what works best for you and what is the least amount of work for you to do this. And still um, takes a lot of the hassle out of the like, email list. Um, another thing to look at is if you have a list of like content creators tips, build a drip email campaign out of that where um, someone signs up to your list and you say, hey, thanks for signing up. You're gonna get like my 12 most popular posts automatically over the next six weeks. And then twice a week, for the next six weeks, they get an email from you with a little bit of content and a link to that post. And they're getting engaged with you, they're learning about you, and they're coming into your universe slowly. And by the time that that drip is done, they're like, I love this person, I love this site, I love their content. That's a really, really cool way to get someone on your list and engage um, and take advantage of the content that you've already produced that you know is successful. Just to add on that really quick, the evergreen piece, right? So keep evergreen content going out and, and shift it up. Like if current events change sort of the purpose or meaning to post a little bit, you know, don't hesitate to kind of revive that and then send it out. Um, I did also want to just add on, you reminded me, um, I work with the guys who created Sendfest. And that's another one of those like super easy, um, you're already writing it, just send it out. So let's go sort of back to the beginning a little bit in, in somebody's process. And do you use an editorial calendar? And if you do, do you have a favorite tool? Or platform? It's 
a great question. Uh, we actually built our own uh, proprietary system, and the reason why is because we couldn't quite find one that had everything we wanted. Uh, but just to speak what's in our, into our calendar is we have the standard calendar of what we're going to post and when we're going to post it. But we also try to, um, we think in terms of layers. So we always have a foundational layer, which is things that don't change. So for instance, last I checked, Christmas was always on the 25th of December. Uh, January 1st is always New Year's. So that's kind of the foundation of where we go. And then we try to build on top of that themes. You know, so a lot of times if it's Christmas, they might want to promote, uh, if it's e-commerce client, they might want to promote retail products and sales during that time. So we kind of use that as a foundation build on top of it. Then we have themes that could be back to school and other things like that. And as we go up the chain uh, we, of that foundation, then we have the ability to have dynamic content that undulates based on current events. So if something happens in the news or whatever, then we have the capacity to have additional content that goes on top of it. Uh, you know, if you don't have access to a tool like that, there's plenty of them out there. I mean, um, it could be a Google Doc. There's tons of those out there. Uh, I think um, Trello is good. I think you mentioned that. I've used that when I first got started. Um, so there's, there's tons of resources out there. I think um, I use a couple of different tools. I've sort of built my own through Google Docs um, because I did find one that had everything. Um, and the way I go about it is I start sort of high level. I'm going to go the other direction and look at the quarter. Um, you know, we've done the year long piece of kind of mapping everything out. We break it down by quarter and overall themes, and then we break it down into month, uh, month by month, plot out the actual days, how we want things to run, um, and then we make it sync up. So that with the social, with every other piece and any sales functions they have going on or, or any big company issues. Um, and then we go into weekly content and usually when we get to that point, um, most of my clients will put it into game, which is a pretty good for content approval. Um, and I wasn't ready to sink into a much bigger version of Hootsuite. Um, and I mean, I'm only, I only been around for 18 months. So we, I wasn't ready right off the bat to sort of sink my teeth in there. Game's been great for the clients who need it. Um, and it's a great approval process schedule it all out, and then it's kind of ready to roll, and we can drag and drop and shift times and dates and platforms. Um, it's been really easy for us so far. So. We explored a lot of options for um, a content calendar, and we used Trello for the first 13 months, I think, that our, our content team existed. Um, we recently settled on CoSchedule, and the reason we um, kept with that is because it has a very, very tight integration with WordPress. It also has um, really, really solid integrations with the social media platforms we use to promote our content, which is Facebook and Twitter primarily. Um, the way that CoSchedule works with WordPress, you can start drafting in a Google Doc or in CoSchedule or um, in, I think it supports Microsoft Word as well. You can import that document into CoSchedule and then click Convert to WordPress and all the content you've already created converts into a WordPress post and you pick the categories, the author, um, and the other basic information, and it converts it for you, and when you go into WordPress, it's already there, and is some semblance of done. So for us, that, that makes the process really, really easy, and it makes the process of visualizing the calendar, and who is responsible for what, great. Um, the reason we chose that over some other similar tools is because of the social um, aspect. We promote all of our, our um, uh, posts and content via social, and it allowed us to put, actually, excuse me, see the social promotions for each post on the calendar as well. So if we schedule eight tweets for a post, they appear on the calendar in line with those posts that we've published or scheduled or converted. Um, and same with email marketing. We put an email marketing event on the calendar, and when it goes out, it appears there, like it's, it's happening. And again, you can sign people to that. So um, it's a great tool um, for larger teams. It is not free. <laughs> Um, so that's why I recommend Trello to like smaller teams or one person teams. But if you want something later on that has a really, really tight integration with WordPress, I am kind of in love with CoSchedule and happy to talk about it. All right, we've been talking a lot about if you're blogging for your clients or your, your corporation. Let's take a minute for the people who are writing their personal blogs. And I, Nicole earlier in her talk said that she spends about eight hours on a post, and, and I think that that's realistic you know, for a lot of people. But let's say you're a personal blogger and you're short on time and you need to get something out there. 
what would you say to the person who needs to produce something? Is there any like workarounds? <laughs> um, I think for the personal piece, you know, the client pieces take a lot longer. Um, but for the personal piece, I am a recovering perfectionist. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be able to that boat. It's a really long process to recover, I guess. I'm not quite there. But I'm learning that published is better than perfect when it comes to my own personal blogs, even my business blogs, which I don't think everyone wants. But um, video, just get on camera and talk. It's kind of the same thing. If you have a thought, just put it out there. Check it for typos and grammar and all that good stuff. Um, but really just, I don't worry about word length. I don't worry you know, about how much is in there. But I try and include a visual. Um, if there's a little video snippet I can do and it's great, um, but I would say just write it. And then keep going. The more practice there is, the better. The other thing I've learned to do is time block, um, especially because I feel like most days I'm split in a few different directions. Um, but give yourself, I'm going to sit and I'm going to write for 25 minutes, set a timer, and just do it. Um, and then when you're done, you're like, okay, great, edit, done. The way I got to using WordPress was I got a blog about Japanese music. And um, I did that for four and a half years. And time became very valuable for me because I was working full time, going to school half time, and then trying to blog full time too. It's very difficult. So um, what I found that worked for me was get in front of my laptop for an hour and just write, like just spurt, write as much as I had in my head and then walk away until the next day. And then after that half hour to an hour, um, the next day I would come back and finalize that post. I would put in the images, I would edit it, I would do the title, I would do the category, I would do the tags, and then publish it. Um, and that method worked really well for me for about half the time that I was blogging. The other time I was being a dramatic perfectionist. <laughs> so um, that can be really helpful, especially if you are strapped for time. If you get an idea, seize it, do as much as you can at that moment, and then just, just walk away until you have time to do the perfectionist stuff. Just one other thing to add, similar to what we do with our clients with the interview, what I typically do when I have to, uh, just for the company blog, because I'll write a lot, I'll quote unquote write a lot of the blog posts, I'm the founder so I don't have to do as much of the actual hands on writing it, I have my team do that, but what I do is I have about an hour commute into the office, so I take my phone and I record myself with the blog post idea, and then similar to what we do with clients, that gets transcribed and then someone in the, in, on my team actually writes it and then goes through an approval process where I approve it. So I try to use the same kind of processes with the uh, clients. We try to do the same thing internally. So we use, again, recordings and transcriptions a lot because it makes the process so much quicker. I can just kind of rapid fire what's on my mind. So one tip that I have is if you are in groups, then you can put out to your community, does anybody have a favorite uh, source for free photos? And then gather all of those, link to them, and link give credit to the people that provided you with the content, which would be a link from your own website. And then also, I have a Pinterest board, and I board infographics, and maybe once every six weeks, if I'm really, really tight, I'll put up an infographic, and I'll write a little All right, so now we are, I'm getting the wind up symbol. So does anybody have any questions? No. No, we have no time for questions. Okay, wrapping it up. All right, thank you everybody. <laughs>